we're back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. My next guest is an important writer and thinker, especially in the field of uh, environment and uh, the future of the environment. Sandra Steingraber is a professor. She is a biologist. She's a poet, an author, also a cancer survivor. She writes about climate change, ecology, and the links between human health and the environment. Uh, one of her well-known books is Living Downstream, an ecologist's personal investigation of cancer and the environment. Um, she is also the author of uh, a recent column I wanted to speak with her about, uh, which was given the headline, uh, How Austerity Killed the Center for Climate Justice, A Farewell to Ithaca College. So without further ado, Professor Steingraber, thank you for coming on the program. Well, thanks for having me, Richard. Oh, it's a it's a pleasure, or I would say normally it's a pleasure, but uh, it doesn't sound like there's good news uh, for the Center for Climate Justice. So if you wouldn't mind just briefly recapping for us uh, what happened and what caused you to write that column, I would appreciate it. Sure. Well, for 18 years, I've had the great honor to be um, a distinguished scholar in residence at Ithaca College. Um, and I really feel like it's been the highlight of my academic career. I am both a biologist and a, um, a writer with a biology degree, PhD and a master's degree in poetry. And I've always said that poetry and biology are both about the mystery of being alive. You know, biology wants to solve that mystery and poetry simply says, behold, right? And so I have bounced around um, between many institutions through my career. Sometimes I'm a writer in residence, sometimes I'm a scientist in residence. And so when the previous provost at, Ith at Ithaca College in 2003 recruited me there, it was, to um, to let me be my, show all my colors um, and to be very interdisciplinary. So I have um, taught my own course on the narratives of climate change, which is an environmental humanities class. And in addition, I guest speak across the curriculum and I may be the only faculty at Ithaca College who has actually lectured in all five of our colleges from the music school to the business school to humanities, sciences, um, the school of communications and so on. And um, so it's given me a really wide view of our, our curriculum. So most recently, um, the austerity measures that are now sweeping through higher education, really kind of weaponizing the pandemic at, um, as the reason that this has to happen has been, um, ha has reached our, our shores at Ithaca College and has hit us really hard. So the proposal is through um, this form of austerity that it kind of goes by the same name everywhere it appears in all college campuses, the kind of academic priority, um, academic pro program prioritization. And so it, ha it has resulted in um, the, uh, the, the uh, involuntary job loss of 116 of our faculty, which represents between a fourth and a fifth of all of my colleagues. So at, at the time this happened, I had been involved um, with the encouragement of higher administration there, trying to launch a center for climate justice that would be a national destination for students who really want the tools of understanding the climate crisis and how to solve it and how to confront it all the way from you know musicians who are really worried that classical musical instruments which are sourced from wood growing in forests that are now being affected from climate change so that orchestras will sound different in the future because the acoustic qualities of the wood are changing because of the climate that that's part of this but also how to teach future journalists how to tell stories about the climate crisis. That was also going to be part of it. So um, all of a sudden, after I um, received a very nice three-year pilot grant to launch this center, with the collaboration of many of my faculty colleagues, we will all work together in a climate action group, um, I woke up to discover that both the co-chairs of the climate action group, two faculty who've been there a long time, um, and who I revere are losing their positions and, and it all together nine faculty um, that teach the climate crisis from various perspectives were going to be out of a job. 
as part of this 116 faculty that um, are losing their employment and their health insurance in, the, in a time of pandemic, right? And so I no longer felt like I had the capacity, sort of the intellectual capacity um, and the collaboration of people that I really need to work with to launch this kind of center. So I chose this moment then to, to retire and to resign myself. Um, and uh, I will figure out a way for my work to go on, um, but it won't be um, within this liberal arts college, which is, which breaks my heart. <laughs> because honestly, I, you know, I'm 61 years old and I've been in school since I've been age five. So I, I, um, I do a lot of activism. I do a lot of advocacy and um, speaking data to power, you know, giving lots of um, testimonies at public um, for uh, like Congress, um, state legislatures. Um, I believe in science for the people in a big way. And, but sort of by personality and by training, I'm really a contemplative academic. And that's, you know, I've always felt like faculty are my tribe and the classroom is my natural habitat. So this represents for me personally, kind of a big, a big transition and not a welcome one. You know, I, I, I have several thoughts, Professor Stangraver, if you don't mind my sharing them. One is, first of all, you know, I, I love the intersection of writing and poetry and science and biology in particular. It seems, you know, maybe this is wrong, but it seems to me that my initial reaction is that both of them are about decoding mystery through language, whether it's the language of, of words or the language of DNA or, but, you know, I, I think that is uh, so close to the human mission and human spirit as it should be in this, especially in this moment of climate crisis as we determine our future. Uh, and in the larger context, one of the things that really moved me about what you're experiencing and what you wrote about uh, and the significance of it for me is that for me at least, it goes beyond austerity. It's almost as if austerity feels like the symptom in this case of a deeper illness, mm -hmm. which is the growing inability of our society and our political economy to value liberal arts, to value pure science, to value the intersectional interdisciplinary thinking that you reflect uh, with your work. So it almost seems to me that sure, they have a budget problem, I get all that. But for example, if you read the Democratic and Republican party I, primaries, of, uh, it seems to me if you read the, for example, the Democratic and Republican Republican Party platforms from 2012, they're almost identical. Education is to prepare people for the jobs in the future. It seems to me the real jobs are inquisitive. They're, as you say, contemplative. They're, uh, for lack of a better word, spiritual. And they certainly involve activism that may not be None of this may be remunerative in and of itself, but I guess what I'm saying is that I fear, among other things, that the academy itself is being lost. Well, I, th these. I think you're right. And I'm glad you kind of took us to this deeper place because I've been thinking a lot about this and um, since I wrote that um, commentary in our student newspaper, The Ithacan, which by the way, our student newspaper has just been this beacon of really great reportage and um, a really reliable forum for the, um, the conflict and the the uh, the uprising among faculty, students, and alumni as we all come to terms with this. So I just want to give them a big word of praise. I think our student newspaper is one of the best student newspapers anywhere. <laughs> um, but to your to your larger point, I think for me, um, the a liberal arts education is inherently about troubling structures of power, especially economic and capitalist power, because those of us in the liberal arts believe very strongly in, in, in that, that education is values-based, right? It's not just skill training, 
um, it, it allows us to become citizens, to engage as citizens with power structures. And as faculty in the liberal arts, whether we're in the sciences or in the you know philosophy and, and history, I think that what we share ultimately is this feeling of the inherent worth and dignity of a human life. That the human condition that we think about and write about and research, whether as a scientist or a humanist, um, has inherent value and that we are not, like anytime people are dehumanized, um, we get worried because it means in, in I mean, it, it used to be people um, in the Middle Ages were burned at the stake for, for certain kinds of heresy and, and were considered undesirable and had to be discarded and ex exterminated. And, and now, you know, we see that ca capitalism itself is dehumanizing, treating each one of us as disposable cogs in this larger wheel. So if a corporation wants to downsize because it, 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 um, it prioritizes uh, money dri driving to their shareholders rather than the inherent value and in life of a worker, then the workers' lives are just gonna be wrecked, right? And so it's, so it's so painful to me to see this kind of workplace injustice enter the very um, institution that has had this time-honored tradition of qu questioning that and pushing back against that. I mean, if I had wanted to exchange my time, which after all is my lifespan, right? Time is your life. If I wanted to exchange that for high wages within a corporate uh, pro for-profit, you know, give my life and labor to a for-profit company to enrich investors, I would have chosen that path. But I chose this path because I wanted to be part of a public service institution that wants to make the world a better place and 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 has a connection with the community in which we live that tries to uplift everyone, right? And through these kind of town gun partnerships that I believe in so greatly. And so for me to be someone who was about to launch a center for climate justice with everything that just the word justice contains, especially since we understand that creating a renewable world um, means we center justice and provide people jobs like workers. I study a lot of um, um, occupational health and safety issues, especially in oil and gas workers who are just disposable cogs in this big wheel. And they, they suffer terribly. They have the highest on the job fatality rate of almost any other worker. They suffer amputations and crushing industries. They get blown up and burned. So I, I'm collecting data on all of this and believe so strongly in, in a transition that would provide dignified, meaningful, well-paid work um, that wouldn't also blow somebody up or po poison them in ways that are going to cause them to get cancer five years later. And so given that that's my work, how can I launch a center devoted to those ideas at the same time my colleagues are being thrown out and, and now they're jobless, now they have no health insurance. And I note, I began to see that the colleagues who are being affected the, the hit work, you know, this pain is not equally distributed across the, our campus, right? The people who are really hit hard are my younger colleagues who are just beginning their careers, who are in the ranking system that we do with professors, you know, are most vulnerable to job loss. And they still have, you know, thousands of dollars of student loans because they were in this long apprenticeship to get to be a professor. Right. They have young children in the school system, right? They have mortgages they're trying to pay. And this is going to be career, career ending for, me, for many, I mean, they're just not jobs out there. So it just seems to me that a whole, another way of approaching this fiscal crisis, which is real, right? We have, we, our higher administration made the right decision and closed our campus down and went all remote when we knew we couldn't, it wouldn't be safe. And that protected us, the faculty, it helped save our lives. I'm very grateful for that decision. It also meant that we're no longer collecting room and board money and, I think all of us realized we're really running a giant hotel in some ways, right? And that room and board money pays our paychecks. So we do have a problem, it's real. But shared governance would mean the administration and the faculty together trying to figure out how to distribute the hurt in an equitable way. And, and, and to say in a time of a pandemic, look, 
everybody stays on the boat. We're not leaving anyone behind here. You are all valued members of this community. This is your job, and whether you're faculty or staff. So let's figure out a way to keep us all on this boat and do what we have to do you know, in shared sacrifice mo moving forward. That's not what happened. And instead, I feel like it's an example of disaster capitalism, a kind of shock doctrine. And I don't know where it comes from exactly, but I do know it's um, not unique to Ithaca College. It's moving through many colleges right. now, right? It all, and it has this name, academic prioritization program. And what it means is that you make the college smaller, you collect, you get rid of programs that don't have as many students that aren't really driving tuition dollars. Um, it's a very kind of bean counting way right. forward. And it's just so demoralizing. It's hard to imagine that kind of uplifting, exciting education going on and that kind of amazing synergy of thought between faculty and students when everybody is completely traumatized by this now. And meanwhile, uh, and again, we're talking with Professor Sandra Steingraber about uh, her experience of austerity economics at Ithaca College. And meanwhile, Professor Steingraber down the road from you in Syracuse, uh, you have Syracuse University's uh, graduate business program being underwritten by J.P. Morgan Chase. You have this whole phenomenon of the corporatization of higher education in all its forms. And I contrast that with, uh, you know, my dad was a, a college administrator and I did a thesis in school on the medieval university and medieval universities, you know, they were monastic institutions and nobody wanted to be the administrator. That was, you know, they were uh, one person, they drew straws literally and the person with the short straw had to administer, you know, take care of all the uh, administrative responsibilities for a year, you know, and then they got to give it up and go back to what they wanted to do, which is study and reflect. And, and I guess I say all this because like you, I think I always try to bring an activist as well as a reflective bent to what I think about and your piece made certainly made me think. And certainly one area for activism is resisting or these, uh, I forget what you call them, administrative uh, prioritization plans, is that the name? Mm -hmm. um, but even more broadly, I feel we have a mission, us as a community, to re-envision uh, it's, it's a big goal, but re-envision higher education to make it something closer to what it once was, which is a community of scholars trying to learn, study, increase human knowledge and make the world better. But I, of course, I'm just a person, you know, I have no idea how to do that. But do you have any thoughts on that before I, I, I let you go? <laughs> well, my thoughts actually come from, um, um, this amazing group, the United Campus Workers of Alabama. Um, and they have really, they have released a statement that I am just reading and rereading. Um, it came to my attention because it actually calls out Ithaca College as a place where, um, you know, that is using this um, cr crisis, our economic crisis and the, and the COVID-19 crisis as a way to push through these kind of sweeping cuts. So it mentions us by name, um, but it provides a vision for what where we, we should be moving to. And, you know, I, looking back on the kind of golden age of higher education that you're referencing, where we were contemplative stuck scholars where nobody really wanted to do the, the bean counting work of administration and making budgets, th those were also, the, those scholars were mostly older white men, right? So- Sure, of course. Yeah, right. like I wouldn't have even been part of that. Um, so right. I, I, I appreciate the, the um, progressivism and the, the way that higher education has, has allowed me, a woman in STEM, and also who still writes poetry, right, to find a place in, in this community. Um, but but what, what the um, United Campus Workers in Alabama say that if this is now an opportunity to strategize, strategize and collectivize, to move forward with a new labor movement across working groups, across campuses, um, and across state regions. And they're calling really for, um, 
job security, increased equity, and affordable health care for all campus workers. So instead of kind of anointing an elite class of tenured professors and offering them um, lifetime employment and, and academic freedom, which is desperately needed, and I would defend that to the death, right? Because we we remember the McCarthy era, and we remember sure. if 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 um, scholars don't feel free to pursue the truth where it leads them because there'll be political fallout, then that then we can't do we can't create new knowledge. So, but but rather than contract, we should be exp expanding those kind of protections in e equitable ways. And so I do think um, this statement is correct, that this is a moment of crisis. It's also a moment of opportunity to rethink how we do this. Um, but it also really sheds a light on the fact that increasingly, I would say ever since 1970 in Kent State, that um, the colleges have become um, sort of animus um, to mm -hmm. a conservative um, moneyed class. And the, the federal government and the state governments have gotten out of the business of providing public funds to higher education, which has opened a void of revenue that was then filled by sort of CEOs and donor class people who then sit on boards of directors and they, they don't have a kind of humanist teacherly mindset that they, they have these other ways of looking at the world and that is kind of i think one reason that we, what's driving the kind of corporatization of higher education right now but um yeah it's it's just really heartbreaking to see um amazing educators who are so beloved by other students you know um yeah. there's a one of my own students is the daughter of another Ithaca College professor um, in the uh, politics department who's losing his job. And then she's also losing her ability to be a college student, you know? And so she's suffering from terrible migraine headaches now and missed a lot of my class. So the, the, the trauma <laughs> that these job losses create ripple way beyond the people who are losing the jobs. It affects their families, it affects our whole community here in Ithaca. And, and having said that, I just <clears throat> I do want to end by saying how much I believe in my own department. I, I'm my work is embedded within the Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences, and I have been entirely supported there for many years. And and the faculty who have not lost their jobs in that department are some of the best educators I know, and they will carry on. So I feel like I'm walking a little bit of a tightrope here because. I want to be able to speak out against an injustice that I'm seeing, um, but I also um, don't want to interfere with my department's ability to kind of carry on and recruit students. Because if you if you want a good education in environmental studies, you could do no better than Ithaca College. And I mean, some of that goodness will st still remains, but my my own work became it. Uh, it just wasn't possible for me to to carry on there. Well, I think it's tragic, actually, and uh, but I'm. Delighted to know there's still good work continuing. Uh, I guess last question for you, uh, if you don't mind, uh, what are your plans now? Well, I'm still figuring it out <laughs> and I'll have more to say in about a month, but I have um, been always had kind of one foot in academia and one foot in advocacy and activism as I confront the climate crisis. I'm you know, convinced um, as a professor, that more and better knowledge about the climate crisis is not what's going to move the needle to toward the radical changes that we need. If science could have done that, um, it would have happened when the nation's best scientists handed President Johnson a report about, about the changing climate the year I was in first grade. And now I'm 61. So, you know, the scientists presenting data is not what we need right now. Science is necessary, but not sufficient. So I will be um, still a public intellectual, a scientist in the public interest doing science for the people. Um, but I think um, it won't be with the word professor <laughs> in front of my name, it'll be in an, another kind of venue. So um, I'm working on that. Okay, well, I hope you'll keep in touch with us. And as for education, I guess I'll end with, uh, I think it was uh, William Butler Yates who said, education is not the filling of a pail, 
it's the lighting of a fire seems to me to be appropriate now. So Professor, well, I guess I can still call you Professor Sandra uh, Sterngraber. Uh, thank you for the, I'm sorry, Steingraber. Thank you for the uh, wonderful work you've done and will continue to do. And uh, I hope you'll keep us posted on uh, your adventures in the future. I promise I will. Thanks so much, Richard. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and you're listening to Zero Hour.